who is Sean Little Bear? Well, for starters, he knew Chad and Tammy Daybell well. He was in Chad's inner circle, along with many other names that you'd recognize. Melanie Gibb, David Warwick, Jason Mao, Mike Stroud, Hector Sosa, and the list goes on. Chad was actually going to publish Sean Little Bear's books, but it never happened. Clearly, we know it never will. Little Bear is a speaker with the organization Preparing a People and spoke of his near-death experience along with Chad at events and on podcasts. Sean Little Bear spoke with me about Preparing a People's founding, and he helped me understand a little bit more about Chad's evolving beliefs and who Chad is. At Hidden True Crime, we are grateful that Sean Little Bear spoke to us about what he knew and his experience with Chad, with Lori, Melanie Gibb, and others. He was very open with me. We spoke for three hours. He let me ask a lot of questions and I've learned a lot of new information. We think you will too. This is Sean Little Bear's story and his perspective. And I think there's a lot to take in. Oh yeah. Well, I know Melanie uh, back when she was Gibb. I <laughs> stayed with Melanie and Brandon when, we, when they had the speakers at the Mesa conferences. In fact, to start out with, uh, Melanie used to come pick me up and I would sleep on her couch um, whenever I was involved with the conferences. And that's kind of kind of one of the reasons why it roped her in. She actually wanted to speak, but she didn't know what she could speak on. We're talking about Melanie Gibb, to clarify. Is that right? Or Melanie? Yes, that was Melanie Gibb. Okay, because you mentioned and, Brandon, too. But Yeah, Brandon Gibb, her husband. Oh, Brandon Gibb is her husband because Melanie Pulowski's ex-husband's Brandon too. Got it. Melanie and Brandon Gibb. Got it. Okay. Yeah. And Brandon and I were, you know, we were still friends. Uh, he used to work on my back because he's a chiropractor. <laughs> yeah. And I always had back problems, you know, ever since I can remember. And he told me, you kind of easy to fix, but you go back into, you know, um, you know, aches and pains and all that. He said, if I, if you lived out here, he said, I could show you how to, you know, do things that wouldn't be hard on your back. If you notice in most of the videos of the conferences, mm -hmm. I have to have a stool or a chair. And that was because of, you know, traveling is not, not really good on my lower back. Okay. That makes sense. So, so I liked, you know, staying at, um, at Melanie's house in Gilbert because Brandon would come in, he had a little table and he would say, lay out on the table. He said, I know what you need. And he'd start popping and cracking and working me and, and I would get okay. So. Very kind of them. Yeah. Um, I had met uh, Melanie's friends uh, who lived around her. Um, there were quite a few, you know, Jason Mao and, you know, Thor Forseth. And um, at that time, Lori was a different name. Uh, I think she was yeah. Lori Vallow then. Mm -hmm. um, th there was quite a few of us, you know, and, and we were just all getting to know each other. And then when we did become friends, um, you know, things progressed, that was just one group. Um, there was a group in Rexburg. There was a, you know, the biggest group actually was here in Utah Valley. When you say groups, do you mean preparing the people groups or how would you define the groups? They actually really weren't preparing a people at first. Okay. It was only when Mike and Nancy came in and I met them at a, at a different conference. And we had gone to other little conferences in the circle. And it wasn't really about um, what people think, you know. Um, it was about just getting people to prepare just in case. And, you know, trying to spread the word. And it, was, it, it wasn't about, you know, doing missionary work and recruiting and all of that. It, you know, that had nothing to do with it. We would kind of pawn those off on the, on the church and the missionaries and say, you know, you need to go talk to them about that. 
what our thing was, was just getting information out. You know, how can we get information out to bigger and bigger groups of people? How can we have these conferences and invite people? Um, you know, it, it kind of got to be a big monster after a while. Okay. But <clears throat> the actual very first beginning was when I met Mike and Nancy. I showed up and I wanted to collect information for myself. I wanted to buy books, shake a few hands, uh, back when we could do that, mm -hmm. and you know, meet people, say hello, and get DVDs, CDs, books, pamphlets, whatever they could get me so I could take it home and help in Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. Because that's where the natives have concentrated. And that's where this country pushed them. In including my tribe and tell me about your tribe too really quickly so i know well i come from the chachistas nation okay um we originated on the northwest side of the great lakes in canada but we had hunting grounds and we roamed and seasoned all throughout the plains I think one thing I want to understand for me personally is how it started. And you were starting to explain that you, you were speaking, yeah, you I, had I met, met a group of friends with Melanie Gibb, Brandon Gibb, who helped you immensely with your back pain as a chiropractor, you would stay at their home. Well, and then I you met mentioned Nancy. Jason Mao. I met Nance, Mike and Nancy. I met okay. Nancy first. Nancy said Mike had a lot of computer experience, a lot of media experience, mm -hmm. and he knew how to work the cameras. She knew how to do the interviews. And they said, we're, we're going to propose something to you. Would you be a speaker at the very first thing that we're going to speak at? Wow. You will be the literally the keynote speaker. We're going to build this around you. This is the beginning and, um, of preparing. The yeah. And I said, what do you call it? And they said, well, we want to call it preparing for Zion. We want to call it preparing a people for Jesus Christ to return. Excuse me. I said preparing the people and I meant preparing a people. Okay. But it was preparing a Zion. Well, at first. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's what we were playing around with. And we went out to dinner with a bunch of friends and they said, why don't you just shorten it? That way everybody can be involved instead of mentioning Zion or Jesus Christ. Why don't you just shorten it to preparing a people? That way everybody can get on board. Doesn't matter if they're Mormon, or Baptists, or you know, whatever they are. Okay. So yeah. so we actually went with that. And they said, Who's who's the main speaker? And they said, This guy right here, Sean Little Bear. So I told them, yeah. I'll do it. I'll be the anchor, and then I will help you. You know, if there are people I I talk to that have something to say, I will bring them in. As long as they're not too radical, you know, not way out there. Right. We'll start, you know, and let's let's build it. And let's do it from there. So we started actually in people's homes. Okay. In small groups, and then we asked the people, "Do you know friends?" who would come, we could get a bigger place. And they were like, yes, do that. Bigger place, bigger, bigger. So when, when they met, we had actually met people who knew um, that we could meet off of church property onto like gathering places. Mm -hmm. uh, we knew the people that actually had those. So Nancy jumped on it and said, I'll, I'll handle that. Uh, Mike's going to do the media, you do the speaking, and then we'll all help with the speakers. So we drew the talent from, you know, all kinds of places. And next thing I know, it kind of snowballed and there was all kinds of people. They said, let's go after the ones, the authors of these books that we agree with. And Chad came along about three years later. 
Okay, and to clarify, who are all these people? Was it Jason Mao speaking, Hector Sosa? Oh no, Jason didn't come along till right at the very end. Okay, so we're, this is just. Yeah. Was Mike Stroud a part of this? But Mike was on there at the very end too. I okay, mean, at the very end. Yeah. Okay. He wasn't, the, the very end part was we wanted to get groups. Um, not based here. We started taking this group to other places. Okay. And it just became too financially difficult on everybody to travel, to, you know, take everything we needed. Uh, the first meeting we had in Arizona, um, they loaded up a big van and a trailer and Mike loaded the back of his um, SUV and I jumped in one of the back seats and we all took off. And after that weekend, when we drug it all back, they were like, this is just too difficult. We need to have groups, like have a place down in Arizona where everybody will have the equipment and get people, and, you know, they can store it in a garage or whatever, and then we'll come down and use it. Got it. And the same thing happened in Rexburg. Mike and Nancy actually moved when I first started, they were here in Utah Valley. And then they said, we're going to move to Rexburg. And I was like, why are you going up, up there for? And they were like, we feel spiritually drawn to Rexburg. Mm. I was like, you do know that volcanoes are going to go off up there. You guys are going to deal with a lot of ash. You know, there's, there's going to be things unique to Idaho. Right. And the first time I slept up there, I had a dream that was just, ugh. And I wrote it down on a piece of paper. And it took, you know, I just kind of did a synopsis. And I said, this is what I dreamed about. And I showed it to the people and they were like, oh. I was like, you think this is a refuge and, and it probably will be from the world, but you're gonna have to deal with the uh, Yellowstone volcanoes. You're going to have to deal with the flooding from the mountains. You know, there's, there's going to be a lot of things happening. So I wrote down what I saw and they would just kind of, you know, kind of raise their eyebrows a little bit. So after we got, you know, the Mike and Nancy thing going. Yeah, sorry, and I interrupted. That. You were getting, you, they said, let's go after the authors. Yeah, they, well, we started having groups. Um, Melanie wanted to be the group leader for Arizona. Okay. Um, there was um, another lady that wanted to be one of the group leaders in Rexburg. There was another lady that wanted to be a group leader in Ohio. Um, we had uh, my group in Oklahoma. Um, there was another group in Colorado. So we were just starting these, you know, kind of let's share all the information groups. And then um, I can remember uh, Mike was really liking um, Julie Rowe. Okay, Mike James, Nancy's husband. Yeah. Okay. And he wanted to invite her to Rexburg. And he and Nancy, I was riding with them when we went to that conference and they, they just went back and forth. Well, Nancy said, if, if you're going to invite Julie Rowe, then I'm going to invite Chad Daybill. And I really didn't know who Chad was at that time. And they were just putting together things in 2015. Was this because Chad was her publisher or how did they go together? She had known Chad from um, Utah Valley a long time ago. Okay. So I don't know. You'd have to ask her about all that. Okay. I just know that she was the one that wanted to bring Chad in and, and Mike wanted to bring Julie Rowe. So they both agreed. Okay, you bring Chad, I'll bring Julie Rowe. And I didn't know who either was. I said, well, this is the first time I'm going to meet him. Yeah. And they looked back at me, they said, you know, they've got lots of books. <laughs> and I was like, if they're not writing about native subjects, then, you know, even if I would have encountered them, I, I just okay. don't have time to read everybody's books. 
Correct. So they explained that they were, you know, spiritually gifted. They had, you know, Chad had near death experiences and Julie had, you know, predicted things and whatever, whatever. So I told them, well, you know, they're just like all the others. Let's, you know, I'll get a copy of their books and maybe I'll have time to read them or peruse them once I get back to Oklahoma. So I really didn't think anything of it. And we just kind of progressed from 2015. And I got to know Chad and we actually spoke together at different occasions for different groups. There's Did he one group your that, friend? Was he your friend? Well, he had um, been involved with uh, different people. And one of the groups that I was involved in in Salt Lake was not preparing people, was not any of the other conferences. These are small groups of people that meet together that are like-minded. Okay. And they really like to vet the people that they bring in. And one of them had said, suggested, hey, let's have Chad Daybill talk. And I kind of looked over at them and I said, I know Chad. And they were like, great, let's bring him in. And I, I had actually told Chad in 2017, he was at a conference at the, the Dreamers, you know, with the Dream Girls. I don't yeah. know if you ever heard about them guys. 2017, and, did you say? Yeah. Okay. That was when they were first coming out. They they did a, a conference, I think, in 2018. Okay. And I pulled him over and I said, Chad, I'm seeing something in your future. And I want to tell you a story. And I told him a story about, you know, how the um, the sheep, native sheep herders, mm -hmm. when a sheep goes missing, they have to go look for it because there's only a certain amount of time that you have to rescue a sheep. Um, you can rescue it after that, but you'll probably have to butcher it. Yeah. And the reason is, is because the sheep have to keep moving all the time because the flies get in their ears and go up their nose and lay eggs. And you'll notice later on, they'll be walking in circles because the, the eggs hatch and the little larvae go up into the brain. And I was like, Chad, you're, you're fixing to stop moving. Something is going to get you and you need to be on the, the lookout. And he kind, of, he kind of laughed it off. And, you know, I was like, if you believe in what you say in your books and you believe what's happening in these conferences and what we're talking about, then you will understand what I'm trying to say about you. And I had met um, a girl at one of the conferences and I had talked to her at length and she was getting a divorce. And, you know, I told her, if, if you ever want to get together. So we got together later on and in 2018, we actually got married. And in 2018, we went actually onto a retreat with uh, Melanie and um, there was a few people from the groups and there were some people from other groups that we had gone to and they all came this up. This was to, a 2018 retreat? Yeah. We went up to um, uh, Northern Utah to a camp and I said to, at then that time, my wife, I said, you know, I see the same thing happening for Melly, Melanie Gibb. It's something that's coming and she's gonna have a really difficult time with it. And when I went back to her house, um, basically she asked Mike and Nancy and the rest of them, can you um, have Sean stay somewhere else? So in the fall of 2018, when I went down there for the conference, um, I didn't stay at her house. Um, I stayed with other people. 
because she had done a podcast. She was just into podcasting and she got the equipment and she set it up. She said, I'll, I'll do an interview with you. And during that interview, I told her, you know, there's something that's coming for you, Melanie. And I don't know what it is. I don't know where it's coming from. I don't know who's going to be involved. I just know in your future, you are going to have a really difficult time with it. And, you know, she kind of shrugged it off too. She said, well, I'm, I'm going through a difficult time because I want to separate from my husband. And she had actually got with one of our friends up here in Utah Valley. David Warwick. David Warwick. I had spoken with David at different times um, because they wanted both of us. In fact, David actually, uh, when it was just me and Mike and Nancy and me and my wife, we all got together and David told a dream and he said, I don't know what this dream's about. And right there, when he finished, I said, I will tell you exactly what your dream was about. You may not accept it, but here's the explanation. And I went down the row point by point. And he said, that makes sense. And Mike and Nancy were just, they were like, wow, we didn't know you could do that. And I said, well, <laughs> you know, that's where I come from. You know, you're always into church subjects, but down home, you know, I'm, I'm one of the, the medicine men. And this is what I do. I can read things. I can see things. So after that is when, you know, we kind of looked at each other and we're going, you know, David and Melanie are spending a lot, of, awful lot of time together. And they're both married and at this point then still. Th they were in the process of separating okay. at that point. Mm -hmm. So my wife and I, we were like, well, you know, that's probably the reason why they want to distance themselves. And, you know, because we were friends with Brandon too. Right. That makes sense. I, I really like Brandon and the kids and, you know, the, the kind of setup they had in Gilbert. It, it was awesome. So, you know, I met Thor down there. Thor lived just, you know, blocks away from, from Melanie um i started meeting people at the conferences that would just come show up for a certain speaker and then they would leave mm -hmm. um i actually did meet Lori. i did meet uh, charles vallow i shook his hand i didn't know him um there were people that you know they they have pictures of now and i'm like oh i i've seen those people they come and stand around in the back of the conferences. Um, the 2018 yeah. retreat, I just have to ask before I forget, the, the camp. W was Lori or Chad there at that oh, camp? Oh, that, that was in the summer. Uh, Lori wasn't there. It was Melanie and David that were there. Okay. And we, it, it was just an open field, like a cow field. And they said, you know, we're, we're setting the little honey buckets out and you guys just pitch your tents wherever you can find a spot. So Melanie told us to come camp with her. Got it. And there's, we been noticed rumors, how... there's been rumors that maybe Chad and Lori knew each other longer than what Melanie Gibb has told others, but I can't confirm that. So that's why I was asking. Oh yeah, I, I believe that. You do I, believe I, that? I believe that because when we... The summer camp was up in the mountains. Mm -hmm. The conferences were always at different set places. And when we were um, down in Arizona, I know at one of the conferences, Chad just breezed in to do his speaking. And then he would kind of go off to the side and meet up with people and then they would be gone. And Corey I noticed- Chad would be gone? Yeah, they would be with a group. And then whenever they went out, wherever they went out, you know, they they kind of paired up and went off. Because we didn't hear from them again after that until the very end. When and was that? I, would, I am just trying to get a timeline of maybe when they possibly met. When was that? When they actually met would have been, you know, what Melanie Gibb 
is kind of saying. Okay. Because I didn't live there. I was just a visitor flying in, you know, doing my speaking. And I would stay a few days extra sometimes uh, because people wanted me to, you know, go to this house or that house or, you know, people had questions. The first time I went, went down there, Melanie stayed at the conference with us. And I think Lori had to leave because of her kids or something. Okay. And they actually boot chewed us out of the building at about midnight. And everybody was still talking in little groups because it's warm, you know, down in Arizona. Mm -hmm. um, we were out there still talking at 3.30 in the morning. Yeah. And that's when they said, you know, you need to stay a few extra days instead of flying out the next day. Stay a few days and then we'll meet at this person's house or that person's and then this is you know, said to Chad Daybell? Uh, that was said to me. Got it. Okay. Sorry. Um, but I did notice that at those late, you know, everybody would stay at those late ones. Chad wouldn't be there. He, he would be out and gone. And, you know, Melanie would just, she wouldn't come out and say it, but she was like, you know, that one over there. And, and Chad, they, they, they go off. So it was implied mm -hmm. that they were together. Or yeah, they, together. they were both married. You know, Lori and, and Chad, were, right? Lori was married to Charles. Chad was married to Tammy. Yeah. yeah. They would pair There off. were others that, you know, I'm not going to go into detail, but there were others that were there that were doing the exact same thing. Hmm. They would meet somebody at one of the conferences, take a shine to them, and then they would just, they would be gone. They would disappear. We'd be like, where's so-and-so? Oh, they had to leave. I'd be like, well, I saw them getting in the car with somebody. Hmm. Okay. Well, that's an odd little thing that comes from so we did, a we people. Didn't, yeah, we were <laughs> like, pairing off. you know, what is all this, you know, going on behind the scenes? Right. And, you know, there was some stuff that went on behind the scenes that I don't think people really know. And it, it, it just, that's one of the reasons why when all of this started, I kind of quit talking. I was like, I'm, I'm, I'm zip lipped and uh, I'm gonna stay out of the public eye. And it is only recently, just this spring that I've gotten the, the prompting that I need to come out, I need to. One of the things was when we did the organizational part, of this and we would bring the speakers in and tell them you know this is this is the organizational part we're not going to get into your books deep into subject matter it's like you only have one hour to speak at the conference one weekend one hour um, because I was a founding member they would give me the later speaking time and I actually got to go out and speak for an hour and a half or two hours not on a side audience, but to the main audience. Mm -hmm. And that was kind of one of the things that was understood is that we are getting the message out. We are not to go into like recruiting or getting people to be part of our, our little group or whatever we're doing. Um, it's just like, kind of like the missionaries. You share the message. If they get it, they get it. If they don't, they don't. We need to move on. Yeah. So we kind of developed that, you know, okay, we're going to, we're, here's what we're going to do. Here's, here's the inner circle. And I was not in the circle. I was the middle of the circle, so to speak. Okay. And then here's these other circles that were kind of partially in with us and partially out. And we had to tell them that this is what our goal is. And we're gonna map out, you know, different things. And if people go beyond that, that's up to them. You know, anybody can, you know, speak in a house or get a gathering or whatever. But we noticed that with, with Julie Rowe, with um, some of the speakers, 
that had come in, they had really taken things to left field. Julie Rowe, who else took things to left field? Uh, there was a boy that came in talking about the Nephites and he dressed up in armor and did yeah, a bunch of crazy stuff. Yeah. yeah. Odd. And then we we took uh, one of the ladies that we knew and let her speak and and she jumped off the stage and started dancing around in the front with the microphone and what everybody was like no that that was uh, one of our friends from Rexburg and she's out there anyways and we, we all were just like okay no more this one no more that one uh, let's let's move on but I know the organization, we had goals. Um, we used these little charts to not to do anything to anybody or, you know, we just filled it out. So like this member, that member. Um, and we all got together and, you know, said, do you feel comfortable with this, with that? I think Chad and Lori and those that kind of branched off from that, I think they took those and started doing their own things with them. You know, saying okay. if people seeing seeing if people were light or dark or if they had bad spirits in them or if they you know did this or that or. Well, tell me. So the organization goals or the things that they took from preparing a people were what that they then stretched. Well, it was just the diagram, I think, okay. of having people, you know, we, ours was for, should we let the, you know, should we let this one go up there and speak? And how's mm -hmm. it going to reflect on us? Right. Where they took it was, let's, you know, let's categorize this person and, and see, you know, if they're spiritual, if they, you know, if they this or that. And that's where you find all those weird charts come out to where oh. they say they're God. they want to be gods they want to do this they want to do that they took it to the extreme they did they took the organizational part of what we did and kind of perverted it to their own ends okay so to clarify the light and dark scale sort of evolved from yeah that that was the people organizational no, goals no. with try to find out how spiritual a person was and if they fit the speaking elements that you guys well it was just a requirement you know you can't you know you can't go up there and do your own agenda so to speak or you know you can't promote something that only you know it's right. got to be based up by witnesses evidence you know all of this and they took that whole paradigm and just ran with it in their own thing creating a light and dark scale yeah creating if people were going to be gods if they were translated if they you know if they had demons or evil spirits and we never ever went there it was just you know that was i was listening to the other show and the lady was saying this isn't part of the church this is a secret combination and she researched it and i was like that is exactly what that is it had nothing to do with us it had nothing to do with our group it had nothing to do with the conferences that may have been their meeting point but they left and did what they did they did they could not do that at our conferences so they asked me will you come out and clarify that one day I said, you know, I don't feel like speaking, but maybe one day, you know, because I was having some health issues and health problems. Ended up having a heart attack last year, got COVID, had a heart attack after I got COVID. Um, they had to do heart surgery on me. It took me months to get over that. And then I had a, a digestive issue, went back into the hospital for weeks and uh, it's just been, you know, a long haul for me. Yeah, I'm sorry you've so, been so sick. But I used to stay in Rexburg at a house right down the street from Chad Daybell's. Okay. And I knew all the neighbors. 
not the ones north of Daybells, but the ones south of Daybells. I, I knew a lot of those people. Okay. And in fact, I set up a sweat lodge. I built a sweat lodge in 2017. And I actually invited Chad, but he was so busy with whatever he was doing, he, he didn't come down. But I used to walk up the street and talk to Tammy. And she had ducks at that time. And I loved her duck eggs. And she said, for you, I will save you some duck eggs. But she said, for all these other people, I won't. So I was like, well, I'll, I'll come up and get them when I'm up here. So I would go and she would hand me a little basket or a bag of duck eggs. And they were awesome. I just loved, I loved her duck eggs. But she invited me up to the last time she spoke at the ward. And all the people, you know, just down the ward, you have to go from Fremont to the other county. And then there's the ward before you go over the bridge. Mm -hmm. That's the one everybody on that north side went to. Okay, all and this is Tammy speaking to her congregation and she invited yeah. you. Yeah, so my wife and I, we went up there and she did an awesome job. I, I was just, I was thrilled. Like, I'm glad I came all the way up here. <laughs> So we, we gave her a hug and then we had to go after. And that was pretty much the last time I saw her. When was that? That was in the spring. Of 2019? Yeah. Okay. Well. But we had heard um, certain things had happened. And I, I kind of quit talking to Chad after after those things started happening. What things? This, this was long before the kids' disappearance. What things? Um, one of my friends, I can't mention his name because I haven't told him I would tell anybody, but okay. he cleaned the chapel with Chad after the services. They were part of the, the priesthood that took turns. So he and Chad cleaned the chapel one day and Chad found a necklace hanging on the podium microphone. I don't know if you had heard this before. I think I might have heard a rumor, but I didn't know if it was true until this moment. Well, I actually asked Chad, I said, I need to know about the necklace. And he looked at me and he said, I'll, I'll call you. I'll give you a call. So I told my wife, I said, he's going to call. So when we got back to Provo, that time we were staying in Provo, um, he came over to the house in February of 2020. And he handed my wife a, um, a little memory key. And he said, Sean's book is, I had actually been working with him on him publishing my book. And he said, Sean's book, is on here, everything we've done. I'm giving it back to you, and I wasn't there. He gave it to her and he said, uh, here it all is. Um, my daughters, my nieces that help him type said that um, you know they were going to college, they didn't have time. He said, I don't have time to editorialize. And he said, by the way, I'm getting out of the publishing business. So he asked me, he said, you know, you don't owe me anything. Here's everything. You know, your book is actually way bigger than the books that I publish. So we would have to do volumes. And I was like, you know, I, I know, Chad, you know, you know, the story. There's, there's always more to it that I, I can't put in. So he gave the book back. And then later on in the years, when I, I heard more and more stories coming out. Every time we would go to Rexburg, my friend would bring me in and say, you know, this and that, this happened, that happened. And there was some, you know, like I said, some behind the scenes stuff that I was, I was seeing that I did not like. So for our viewers that haven't heard the rumor that I've had, go back to the necklace really quickly to finish the story. He was cleaning the chapel. He yeah. found a necklace on the podium. My friend told him to put it in the lost and found, and they would notify the bishop. 
um, Chad put it in his pocket and they continued cleaning. And his friend had to leave, my friend. And Chad stayed in the chapel and said, I'll lock up, you, you go ahead. From what I gather, he took the necklace home. And the guy that cleaned the chapel with him, who's one of my friends too, um, he said, you know, that week, that very week, he said, we used to call each other every single day, if not every other day, and catch up and talk. Mm -hmm. And he said, that week, we quit talking. We haven't spoken since. And this is what he told me last year. He said, it's been a couple of years since we even said a word to each other. Mm. And this was before everything started. And I was like, do you, you know, do you think that the rumors are true? And he said, I was there. He said, I know he didn't turn it in because I asked the bishop, we looked for it, couldn't find it. And he said, I inquired about it. And he said, spiritually, it was shown to me that Chad uses the necklace as a pin law. And he asks it questions and it tells him yes or no. And he said, I, I fasted and prayed about this one. He said, I wanted to know where it came from, who left it there for him to find or me to find. And the only thing he would tell me, he said that necklace was left there by the adversary for a priesthood holder to find. And I was like, ooh. And he said, I, I he said, I, I get chills just speaking about it. He said, I will not go into more detail. He said, you ask Chad. So when Chad said he would call, it was in the end of July. And in October, he came over to the house of 2019. He said, I'm passing through Janelle had actually taken, my wife had taken some books home from one of the conferences and he looked at it and he said, there's a partial, you know, filled box of books right here. And we were one of the last to leave. And he said, if you guys want to take it home, he said, take out of it what you want. You can have, you know, whatever you want out of it. And so Janelle took it and put it in the, the trunk and later on, when we contacted him, he came by and he said, I, I just came to get the books if you still have them. And we told him, we don't want them. <laughs> we, we pretty much perused all of them and we know what they're about. And, you know, we just don't have room on our shelves for them. So here you go. She gave the books back to him. He said, I don't have time to stay and explain, but he said, I want to explain to you about the necklace. And that confirmed for me right there that he actually had it. Wow. I was like, okay. This, so he stole the necklace wanted, and claimed it was a pendulum. It, no, he, he just said it was a necklace. He was using it as a pendulum. And my wife was like, I have pendulums galore. I use it in my energy work. And she said, I always make sure that there's no bad energy around them. Mm -hmm. She said, so yeah, pendulums can, you know, have bad energy around them. They can be used for good or bad. I said, I think he was wearing it. Because I did not get a good feeling about Chad. So he was supposed to call us within a few days in October. And then the news broke and Tammy had passed away. And in fact, it was one of our friends that lived right down the street that called us. And we were expecting Chad to call us. And I looked at my wife and I was like, she was the picture of health. There was nothing wrong with this lady at all. She was smiling, she had a glow to her, she was vibrant. 
the last time we saw her, she was not sick, period. So we kind of looked at each other and we knew because he had gone off with Lori. Mm -hmm. And we kind of knew, we looked at each other, we were like, oh, something's up. Yeah. And then next thing you know, we were like, well, we'll go to her service because they're going to bury her in Springville. We mm -hmm. just lived in South Provo, which is hop, skip, and a jump away. Right. We heard we heard nothing until after it was all done. Well, so you didn't even know about it because it happened. We so did. Fast. We didn't know that she was. You know, we were at, we were actively listening for when the date was. If they were even just going to have a gravesite, we wanted to show up. And it was like it was all held in secret. We we knew nothing, and we were like, "Wait a minute! We you know we talk to Chad all the time. What's what's up with this?" So after that is when all communication stopped. He never called to explain about the necklace. Never called he to never, tell you Tammy was dead. He never said anything. Never called. When we tried to call him, all we got was a voice mailbox. He so, just the moment Tammy passed away or was the moment Tammy was killed. He's been charged now with murdering Tammy. Mm -hmm. he, you never heard from him again. Nope. And we looked at each other and I said, how do you think he did it? And she was like, I don't know. It'd have to be something untraceable. And I was like, he wasn't untraceable. But I do believe that she was drugged. Why do you say that? just the way that things were going, just the feeling I had that there was something very specific that was used. So I was like, you know, if the guy wanted to kill his wife, you're close enough, you can do that. You know, you wouldn't have Joe come in and do it. Right, although it was mentioned this threw me off in the in the charges in the indictment. I mentioned that on the night Tammy died, that Alex Cox's car was parked in the church parking lot nearby, about a mile away. I didn't know why he would be there. That was interesting to me, but I, I can't put that together. Well, I think they wanted to, you know, like take somebody out with a rifle or whatever. And it didn't, it didn't pan out. Right. It didn't work. Right. So, I don't know. I, my stuff is just speculation, but it, it's kind of in me that, you know, this is what happened. Yeah. When did so, Chad mention to you, when did Chad mention to you that he wanted to get out of the publishing business and kind of said, I'm not going to work on your book? That was February. Of 2019? 2019, yeah. So, I, I mean, he was, plotting, he was plotting Tammy's death then, then, right? I mean, he, he, was, he was making changes, yeah. And I just yeah. figured he was doing that so that he could, you know, exit and get with this other woman. And Who then you knew we about? Had, you knew about the other woman? Lori. It was right after we heard Tammy and we tried to get a hold of Chad and nothing and we were like you know these people that that meet at these conferences they are some of them are very spiritually gifted and some of them are wolves in sheep's clothing yes and some of them come just to trawl mm -hmm. so you've got to be careful who you meet who you shake hands with I know one conference we went to Rexburg and Julie Rowe requested to meet with me alone. Her and Chad Daybell were at a house and they sent me a message and Mike and Nancy came over and they said, Julie's requesting to meet with you alone. And at that time, um, my wife was my fiance. Okay. And we went to do laundry and they said, have you got time to go out there? And I looked at her and she looked at me and I said, I'm not going alone. If I go, it's with my fiance. So Nancy called him back. And then she said, 
she's requesting that you go alone. And I said, no, I do not want to go alone. So I'm just going to decline the whole thing and we're going to just do what we're doing and not even, you know, and that didn't even happen as far as I'm concerned because I don't want to hurt any feelings. We didn't find out till later that Chad and Julie wanted to share with me that I had a previous life. And in that previous life, I was Samuel the Lamanite from the Book of Mormon. And they wanted to basically grill me on certain things. And they wanted me to go there alone. Hmm. Well, what, and that's what I found out from Mike and Nancy. Well, one of their friends pulled me over because the place that we stay at in Salem, and this is kind of a weird connection, the guy that lives in the basement is the father-in-law of Julie Rose. The, the bodyguard, Joel Gervin. Okay, father-in-law of Julie Rose bodyguard, okay. Yeah, so Joel comes to the house where we were to visit with them because they're, they're family. Is Joel the father-in-law or Joel the bodyguard? Joel's the bodyguard. Okay, He's, got it, I, I've heard he of would, Joel. Yeah, he would be kind of like the nephew of this guy. Okay. And so I, I didn't realize all that. I was like, you know, this is news to me. And when we came in, um, there was a lady that pulled us over and said, uh, I need to talk to you. She said, you know, Julie Rowe was after Sean, not because of a, a, a strong spiritual thing that he has, but she said, I'm just gonna say this bluntly. She wants to have a child by Sean. And Julie was married. She right. lived in Kansas. You know, I was yeah, like, I know. I was like, oh, it, that's not going to happen. You know, that, that's no. We're and never who was it that told you this? The person that pulled you aside with Joel? It was, no, it was one of the friends that we had met in Rexburg. Okay. It was a lady that goes to all the conferences. She knows Nancy. She knows us, she knows okay. all the players. Okay. And she just said, you need to be really careful. And we told her we are because she she's made requests. She's, in fact, she got Nancy to talk to Mike and Mike and asked if I would do a podcast with Julie in the backyard of their house in Rexburg. Yeah. So you'll notice one of those that they had, well, they probably took it down now, but. Well, One of those podcasts that Mike had, it was with Julie Rowe in the backyard. And I told him, we're, we're meeting at a public place. He said, we'll be outside. She's not coming in. So I did a podcast with her. And that was the only time I did. Outside. Was outside of Mike and Nancy's house. The Julie, were Julie and Chad having an affair? I don't think so. Okay. They just but I know collaborated they, with religious? Yeah, they, they were really close there for a while. They were, you know, like, like pals, pals. And so story, I asked Joel. Yeah, there, I asked Joel. There's a story Joel, on, uh, that Julie told, I believe it was on Nancy Grace, that Chad assaulted her during an energy healing session. Do you think that's likely true? For me, I think that she said that to kind of cover herself because they were kind of touchy-feely, lovey-dovey there for a while at the conferences. And everybody knew, you know, they, they were friends anyway. Were they inappropriate then? I, for me, I would say that, you know, yeah, they were both married. Right. You, you shouldn't be, you know, grabbing a hold of somebody like that when you're married. 
In public. Yeah. And I was in public. So, you know, at the conference in Rexburg in the summer of 2017, he came up, Chad, came up and gave witness of Julie Rowe. Because when she came up to speak, there was a lot of people that went outside to the tables that were selling books and all kinds of stuff. And they just weren't into Julie Rowe. But there was a lot of women that came just to hear her. And, you know, I was like, if, you know, if Mike and Nancy are okay with it, I'm okay. And then weird stuff happened. So that made you uncomfortable, but Mike and Nancy were okay, so you went along with it. And then, yeah. and then, and then more stuff happened that made you uncomfortable. Go ahead. Sorry, I interrupted. I, I want to hear this. Well, the stuff happened at the conference. When Julie Rowe got up to speak, I, I told them I'm going to run outside and get some fresh air. I don't know Julie, but, you know, I, you know, I can come in the last half of her talk. So I went out, tried to find Rod Meldrum, and I, I was standing there talking at his table, and all of the car alarms started going off on all the cars on the north side, and it made its way around all the way to the south side. And we were standing there watching the cars one by one go off. And, and all of them were just screaming. And then it went across the street to the fire station and all of their cars started going off. And then it came back across the street and went through the parking lot. And then a huge whirlwind started twirling the trees. Okay. And I looked at Rod, I said, do you think we ought to you know, do something like with the priesthood? Sounds like something's going on. He was like, something's going on. So we did a little priesthood thing and it, it all went away and all the car alarms went off and went back off from, you know, buzzing. And I said, I'll, I'll be right back. And I went inside and listened to the rest of Julie Rose talk. Okay. And I was, I was looking at her like, you know, she had a lot of bodyguards for some reason. I don't know why she, yeah. she said she had death threats or whatever. I, I don't know. But I was looking at her like, you know, <laughs> this is not what we're about. Okay. We're about something different. You saw the difference. Is, yeah, from what she's talking about. And even Chad was kind of like on the border. Hmm. He, he was, but, he bear, but he bore witness of her. Yeah, he tried to get everybody to, you know, was, was like, we need to hear this lady. And that's the reason why I said, well, I'll listen to half of her talk. <laughs> I won't listen to it all, but I'll listen to half of it. So I listened to her finish out and then that was it. It was just another weird occurrence, you know, that happened around him. And with everything that was happening, you know, seeing things behind the scenes. After that, I told Mike and Nancy, I don't know how much longer I'm going to be involved with all of this. And what did Nancy say to you? She said, well, we're going to, you know, we're going to get away from this one, that one. And, you know, we need to continue on. And so Nancy and Mike maybe thought, yeah, we might phase Julie Rowe out. But oh, she didn't like Julie from the get go. Okay. It was only Mike that brought her in. She liked Chad. She liked Chad. Yeah. And Mike liked Julie. Did Mike like Chad? Uh, a little bit, not much. I think he kind of warmed up to him after a while. You, you would speak with Chad. Did you like Chad? I mean, before, I mean, let's talk before you knew. You know all the stuff did you find him friendly and likable um i spoke to him because i needed a publisher mm -hmm. he wasn't really a friend until later on we would just chat i would ask him how's the family and he had asked me how's you know the, the couple we used to stay with down the street yeah and I told Who him was that, closest know, to Chad? I don't know. 
I, I didn't really get into Chad's inner circle. <laughs> yeah. Because I wasn't there enough. I kept inviting him, you know, you need to come down to the sweat lodge. And he wanted to know what it was about. And I told him it's about cleansing and purifying. And, you know, you feel a lot better physically and you can relaxes your muscles. And, and my wife said, you know, he won't come down because he likes the stuff that's not pure. And he's, he's got his favorite demons and he doesn't want them chased off. So he'll probably never come, which he never did. Yeah. What else? What else happened that you noticed? I noticed that after, um, after he supposedly took the necklace, he was ducking and diving, trying to get away from, from me, from my wife, from us. In the end of September in 2019, he came to speak at the group in Draper. And one month before Tammy was killed. Mm -hmm. I didn't invite him. And he didn't know I was actually in that group. He just showed up. And I was sitting in the back. I used, you know, they usually have me sit in front. And I was sitting in the back and he came in, started talking and I looked at him, our eyes met and he just got this really nervous, fidgety, you know, everybody was like, his demeanor changed. And I was like, yeah, I looked at him like, I, I know what you're up to, dude. <laughs> and it's yeah. not good. He excused himself. He said, I've got to quit speaking. I've got to drive all the way back to Rexburg tonight and he, he said had, I got he had killed the children by this point he did not have to go to Rexburg that was the thing that's what we found out later he did not have to go to Rexburg he had to go meet Lori he had to go meet who he had to go meet Lori in Rexburg no we were in Salt Lake he was had she to meet in Salt Lake as well yeah so that's interesting because at this point, in September Melody, 2019, Lori would have moved to Rexburg. So he's mm -hmm. driving down to speak at a conference, and she's clearly there, too, with him. Melanie Gibb had given her the information on catching the Allegiant flights out of Gilbert. It goes straight here to Provo Airport from Gilbert, and it's way less expensive than flying from an airport airport you just Near go out Provo. to the, yeah you go out to the little airport in gilbert and it's like 79 dollars. you get on mm -hmm. the plane and you're in provo flies direct lands out here in provo airport it's they're big jets they're the only big jets that fly in the allegiant air and they fly to idaho falls and they're really cheap you can get a flight, you know, an overbooked flight for nobody shows up. You can jump on for like 50 bucks. So in other words, well, you would be were, better off if they were living in Rexburg at the time, because they were, and I believe the children had been killed by September 2019, they would be better off mm -hmm. flying to Gilbert and then maybe from Gilbert to Provo than straight from, from like Rexburg to Provo, maybe. Yeah, because they were getting around, you know, just really quick they have those flights all the time in fact they're doing more and more of them okay so you know when we were talking about the group we were like you know they can get around because they know the ins and outs and you know melanie was you know flying legion air just back and forth like you wouldn't believe just okay. to be up here with david so she was doing the same thing. I know she was. Lori. Yeah. Um, and there were me, connections. Uh, you, you came <laughs> to our were, chat. Go ahead. There were connections between the people behind the scenes. Uh, 
that I just, you know, I was finding out about them uh, up until everything, you know, kind of quit. I had uh, been a speaker with Hector Sosa mm -hmm. on numerous occasions with David. And is he your with, friend, Hector? With Thor. Yeah, I, I'm friends with Hector. And, and Thor as well. Mm -hmm. And Jason Mao, me and Jay Mao, we, you know, we're... <laughs> We came through the same kind of experiences coming up. He was a cop and I was in law enforcement at one time. Mm -hmm. And we kind of understood each other. So between all of the speakers, we kind of, we had a rapport. And there was a couple of times where, you know, everybody was kind of scratching their heads about Chad, you know. Including Jason know. Mao? Yeah, I mean, because he was friends with Lori too, right? Well, even when Jason came in, and he was one of the late ones, he didn't come in until after 2017. And everybody said, you know, he's he's kind of he's kind of overdoing it. He's kind of overcompensating for his past. So they asked the the organizers of the conferences, not just one, but a bunch of them to look into his past to see if what he was saying was actually true. Mm -hmm. And they did that with me. You know, Mike and Nancy came down to Oklahoma and spent like a month. And they they went here and there and, and they sent people from Utah down. I had uh, uh, BYU professors come. I had um, the aide to one of the general authorities actually showed up. I had um, Rod Meldrum and his crew came down. Mm -hmm. um, they were just like, you know, we don't have any proof of these things. We need to see for ourselves. So I took them around and then showed them, here's some places you can go. And when we were driving around, people were honking and waving. And they were like, we don't know anybody down here. And I was like, just, it's my TV show. It's my program. They know me from my TV show. It's on the air now. So they'll honk their wave, just wave back at them. We'll smile. I, like, I don't know them either. It's just, they watch me on TV. Yeah. So I, I, you know, I told them that's, that's one of the things I can't really bear witness to you of. But now that you have a witness, you know, you know, people know me and I don't even know who the heck they are. It's just, I have a TV show and they, they see me. So right. they wait. Right. The, the, the natives down there would come over and shake my hand and go out of their way to say hello and Mike and Nancy would be like, what's that all about? And I told them, you know, when you're a chief among your people, they respect you. Right. They they come over, they go out of the way to say, hello, how you doing? You know, and yeah. they speak to you Indian way and say, you know, pray for me. I'm going to go through this or that or something's happened or, mm -hmm. you know, so they got a, a big witness. And then to to top it all off, the guy, I don't I don't know if you knew that, but the guy with 116 pages, he came into the ward, which I met next to the temple. And he said, I need to speak with someone. And I was the one there from the elders quorum presidency, and I said, I will speak to you. What do you need? Are you talking about the sealed pages? The 116 pages that Joseph Smith lost. Okay, yeah, the lost transcript. That went through the Harrises. Right, Martin they Harris. Stolen from, well, Lucy Harris actually took them to a professor. Right. And he didn't give them back. Correct. I know the story well. Happened. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the, who is that man? That was Dan Judd. That was Dan Judd. So Jen, Dan Judd came in. So go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. Found out he just lived up the street from where the, the temple's at in Oklahoma City. There's only one temple. 
So mm -hmm. it's right next to our ward. So he came in and talked to me and then I kind of handed him over to the missionaries. And then the missionary said, we need to baptize his whole family. So I went over, we met with the family. They said they wanted to get baptized. They were anxious to you know, go into the temple. So we baptized him. Didn't find out till later, later. He did his genealogy and he came to me. He said, little bear, I got I to gotta pull you aside and talk to you. And this is a guy we used to laugh at because he would show up with, he would show up in front of the double doors on fast Sunday with McDonald's sacks and coffee steaming the window. And he'd be waving at everybody going in, you know? <laughs> and I, I had to pull him aside and say, Dan, this is, this is a Sunday we don't eat. He was like, oh, oh, I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. I was like, well, you, don't, you know, you're not a member yet. You're just coming. And by the way, we don't drink coffee either. And you're out there enjoying coffee. <laughs> <laughs> everybody can smell it going into the board building so he pulled me over he said i did my genealogy and i found out there's a full-blood native in my grandfather's lines four grandfathers back there is a full-blood native mm -hmm. married into the smith family and became one of his grandfathers so he looked at me, he said, I am born from them, and I have native blood in me. And I said, that's great, Dan. You want to, you know, you got a little bit of native in you at least. And that's when he said, I, I wouldn't have spoken up or told anybody, but he said, I, I need to tell you this story. So he told me the story about his family, how they kept Hiram Smith's box. He's a Hiram Smith descendant. He found out because he came up here and they did his genealogy, saw it, and then they asked him to do a DNA test. He did a DNA test and Andrew E. Hatt from BYU confirmed that he is a direct descendant of Hiram Smith. Hmm. So he told me about this box the wooden box, the lap box that belonged to Hiram Smith and how it had these pages in it that were written on wrinkly old skin and how his family had kept them and about how that came about. And he said, do you think these people would be interested in that? I said, I think so, Dan. I think they would. There's a story here that needs to be proved out. So that started a whole crap storm of stuff. And people wanted to go through me to get to Dan. Because mm -hmm. Dan didn't know him. So all the conference people up here were getting me to take them over to Dan's house. They wanted to meet him. They wanted to know. They wanted everything. So Dan said, I will get whatever my family has and I will turn it over to the church for free. They don't have to pay me anything. I'll turn it over. But he said, I do know that as a little kid, when I was 10 years old, he said, they took the pages out. He said, before they did that, it had to be after midnight. They drew all the shades on the windows and this is in Oklahoma, by the way. Yeah. In prior Oklahoma. And he said all the people would gather. They would barricade the doors, make everything really dark, and then they would light a lamp and take the box out and open it. And he said all the stuff that was in it, he said the pages weren't everything that was in it. He said there was other stuff. He said my dad used to have a paperweight that he kept on his desk. It was a little pointy ball that had like two little needles that would move around inside. Yeah. And he said he used it for a paperweight for years. He said there was this, these little stones that were white. And he said he didn't know it until, he, until one of them was holding it up to a light. He said the stone was clear. 
He said, there was two of them in there. He said, there was other stuff too. He said, does this stuff mean anything to, to Mormons? And I was like, Dan, yeah, that, that stuff could mean an awful lot to these Mormons up here. So he decided he was going to go after him. And I said, I'll leave it to you, Dan. This is your story. This is not mine. I just shared it with them. I asked your permission before I did. He said, no, 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 you're, you're right. So the information is there. Unfortunately, his family, to keep people looking for them, they had to do a disinformation trail mm -hmm. to keep people off of them because they would up and move in the middle of the night and move states away just because somebody found out somebody was looking for them. So all the disinformation you find that's out there pretty much came from his family to keep people off their trail. They put out all kinds of rumors, all kinds of red herrings because they they did not want to be one of the people that were killed just for you know pieces of paper and what he considered junk <laughs> did dan meet chad and lori i don't know the time that mike and nancy brought him up here to utah um i had spoken with mike and nancy and i said you know Everybody goes through me to get to Dan, and Dan wants me with him when he speaks up here. I said, it's time for him to stand on his own two feet, and I don't want anybody behind me in my coattails. I said, I know what I'm presenting, and if anybody's going to go down for what I'm presenting, it's just going to be me. So I don't want Dan to be behind me i want him to stand on his own yeah so when they brought him up here he came by himself okay and i i did explain that to him did jan ever bring up this is a random question did i have to ever bring up a chris mamelka or do you know about chris mamelka um no and that's okay i think it's a completely that, separate that didn't that didn't come up until after everything had already happened okay okay um yeah zulima there was a bunch of them that were like just bit players and i was like you know they weren't even part of anything back then what about i have so many can i ask you a few questions about a bunch of these people that i have questions about like like zulima that you just brought up and melanie Pulowski. were they in preparing of people? No. No. Um, if they did show up, they were just audience members. Okay. They were not speaking or anything. No, they had nothing to do with it. Because I know um, when I met Charles, he had actually just come to pick up um, Lori. So, I, you know, I just kind of, he was wearing a cowboy hat and I shook his hand. They introduced me to him and then I went on. That was the only time I met him. You, um, you, were, you visited our chat last night and you brought up Lori and you said you always thought she was crazy. Could you share a little bit more about that? Well, that's just the impression I got. You know, when... Um, her and Melanie were going around. They were actually searching together. Um, Melanie what do you mean searching? Wanted, well, Melanie wanted a way to get in to the group. Melanie Gibb. Yeah. She wanted a way in, and she didn't have anything. And by group, do you, are you talk, referring to preparing a people, or are you referring to? Any of them. Just a group of friends the the conference groups the okay yeah know, just the variety of groups or yeah, clips that were out wanted, there she wanted into one of them and she Melanie couldn't, okay. yeah so she decided she would write a book 
because that's what Nancy told her. Everybody's come here is as a book. They have a you know something to tell. They have a rich story behind them. They have right, you know, and she didn't have anything. She was like, oh, I want to be part of it, and she cried. Really, I, you know, we were like, you know, if you want to get to know what this is all about, then you either got to get to know the scriptures really well and tell a, a, a part from your angle or you got to write a book about something when was she crying with you at home with brandon or yeah that was that was right when when we all first got together first met she wanted to be a part of something so bad and she wasn't she was just an audience member this was back before they, you know, I don't know who put a bug in her ear about the book, but she started writing a book. We came down um, the, the next conference or two later and she said, hey, I'm writing a book. It's called Feel the Fire. And she just had it, you know, in pages and she was typing it up, getting it ready. And I was like, what's it about? <laughs> She said, well, you, you got to read it. And she told me she would give me a copy as soon as one came out, as soon as she got it printed up. And it was a little book, I remember. And I read it. She gave it, she gave it to me, but I gave it to my wife and then I never saw it again. <laughs> I Chad think she gave it to somebody. In it, and she referenced Lori in it. Did she, ever, yeah. did she ever talk about her relationship with Lori to you? Uh, not really, other than, you know, she would just mention, my friend's got to go somewhere. Yeah. We got to go do something. And so you knew they were close, but not how close, maybe? Yeah. And I I did tell him I'm going to the temple to live, leave a bunch of cards. And they wanted to go. They wanted to show up. They wanted to be there. But Nancy was getting everything, you know, prepared for the temple thing in Gilbert. And I had already had different things planned. So when she planned that, we had two things and I told her, I'm just gonna go drop off cards that they can do. And they said, we wanna go. And I told them, you know, everybody's invited. Whoever's gotta recommend, whoever can show up. So I didn't actually get to go with them, but they said they were gonna go with the group that day. Um, do you feel like Melanie knew more about what was going on? About the behind the scenes? Yeah. I think she knew a lot more than what she was telling. And what behind the scenes things are you referring to? Well, the behind the scenes, I would say, is the personal interplay that was happening. Mm -hmm. I think she knew more about that than she's letting on. Um, because she clammed up to me after, you know, I told my wife to go and talk to her and mm -hmm. tell her. And then I would try to go up and talk to her at different functions. And she would just, she would do the duck and dive. So I would end up, I would end up talking to David. And, you know, even last year when I went to um, Nancy's son's wedding up in, I think it was up in Pleasant Grove or Highland, somewhere up that way. And Dave and Melanie showed up and Melanie left. And so I went out and talked to David for, for quite a while. And I was expecting her to show up and she wouldn't. She contacted him on the phone. Huh. And he said, well, we've got to go. We've got to do some things. And they, she, he left without her ever being there. To clarify interplay, that she knew about the personal interplay, I just have to clarify, because it, it could mean a lot of things. It could mean like the belief system about zombies and pendulums. No, that, I, think that was, I think that was just Chad and whoever he shared that with. That was, those, that was Chad's belief system. Should we? Yeah. Is that? Okay. Yeah, I, I, so the group could be the Chad's groups. belief system. And Lori believed it, 
clearly. Um, then are you talking about what was going on with Charles being killed when you say interplay? Well, there was a whole bunch of things that happened that she just, she wouldn't talk to anybody about. And then when, you know, when there was even a question about Chad and Lori being together or, you know, being seen around Rexburg, she would just clam up. And I remember she didn't, she didn't talk to me at all after that, after the question started being raised. And I think that they kind of thought I could see into things, which yeah. really freaked, freaked people out when I first came up because I could look, in, look into their eyes and I could tell them certain things. So they thought that was unique and then when everything started happening, that's where everybody just, you know, I could tell there were certain people that just avoided eye contact. Mm -hmm. They would, you know, go around crowds to stay away from me, so. Clearly Melanie heard about Chad's belief system. Did she, do you think she believed it? I think it was something that she just wanted to absorb as, you know, to see if it was, see if it was true, see if, things were the way they were. Okay, she clearly learned it wasn't. Well, she had asked me one time, um, we were actually in St. George at the conference and we met at a friend's house in Tokerville and Melanie came out and she said, I wanna sit by you. And I said, okay, come over and sit down. And we all sat down and they wanted to hear or ask questions of me and um, she said, so what have you heard? She said, I think you've heard something. What have you heard? And I said, well, about what? And she said, well, just you know, tell us what about, you know, have you heard anything like that? And I didn't want to get into an interpersonal thing. So I just, I kind of pawned it off and said, yeah, I've heard about the, the mandala effect, you know, with the Bible. And I asked everybody, have you heard about the mandala effect? Of course, my wife asked, because I showed her. And I said, I just came from Arizona and I met my, my older brother. He went on his mission in the 70s. And he said he has not picked up his missionary set. He put it in a box on his shelf. He said he, he got, had to get a bigger version so he could read it. He said, I haven't read that one since the 70s. And I told him about the Mandela effect and he just, it just rocked his world. You know about that, don't you? Mm -hmm. And what so did Melanie say about it? I, I showed them the scriptures that I showed my brother. And I said, he's actually memorized the scriptures, you know, ever since his missionary days. And he's been a bishop a couple of times. And he's pretty knowledgeable about the scriptures. And I told him they change. It does not matter if they've been sitting on your shelf or not. The moment they change the dimension, they change you. And he didn't believe it so he took he, he dug out his missionary scriptures and i gave him chapter and verse and he went down chapter and verses and he said how can they do that so it's the times we live in it's it's happening and unfortunately the same thing can happen with people you can be something within you can change by dimension. And when you're doing your interplay in the world mm -hmm. with your eyes open, you will have the mandala effect happen to you. And even the very elect can be deceived. So this is, this is part of it.
Yeah. So what was discussed that evening was she looked up the scriptures and it just it just rocked her world too. Melanie Gibbs' eyes were open that evening. Mm -hmm. And I walked them through. I said, here's the steps. And here's the steps that you can be changed as a person. And if you deny it, if you blow it off, if you say, ah, there's nothing to it, then you're one of the most vulnerable to the change. Mm -hmm. And your whole demeanor, your character, the way you live your life, even your beliefs can change. So when we were going through that, she just, her eyes were opened. And I said, you see ch people changing around you, don't you? And she was like, yes, I'm changing. And I said, me too. But, you know, you've got to control your change. Don't let other people change you. So that was our whole discussion that evening. And the people that left were, were just stunned. Mm -hmm. And I was like, we're right in the middle of this, this thing where it has now come. And a new paradigm is overlapping an old paradigm. And you're going to see it play out in the courts. You're going to see it play out in all of these divorces that are taking place because people are changing. Wives, husbands, they're being split. Literally, the ties between them are being cut, not by them, but by outside influences. And it's not a belief system. That's the thing. It's the world we live in. You right. would have to not be here in order to not be affected by it. Yeah. So it's happening in religion. Religion's the same thing. Mm -hmm. It's happening with all these radical people. So yeah. that's what I tried to instill within them. And then I said, I'm, I'm going to clam up, you know, again. The year 2016, I didn't show up at any conferences. I said, I'm not, I'm not doing it from calendar year, January to December, and I didn't. Amazingly, my friend Hector Sosa, he said, I feel the same thing. I didn't know until I came back. He said, all of 2016, he said, I was, I was not in there. I did not show up. I did not speak. So I told Hector, I said, we're probably on the same spiritual level where there were some things that happened in 2016, and I didn't want to be a part of it. You're friends with Hector now. Is that right? Yeah. Hector has been someone in the news that has seemed to really stand by Chad. Even after the, the bodies were found, he said, innocent until proven guilty. Can you give any light on that at all? shed any light on that is he still standing by chad uh i would say hector just has his own views okay i don't know what they are okay what about jason you still good friends with jason uh which one sorry jason mao oh yeah i'm still um, friends with him yeah, and again, you might not know this too. I, I just try to find the answers wherever I can. Um, you know, he was he lived close to Lori and um, Charles and Melanie in Arizona. And after Charles was killed, he had a Facebook post asking if anyone could sell like a green, if anyone was selling a green Jeep, a green Jeep, which is um, Charles's car he was driving and everyone like points that out and like look look he's culpable or he's part of this or he knew what was happening is there anything you want to say to that to clear anything up or help us make sense of that well as far as jason goes i don't think that he was helping with any of it. Okay. 
I think that he kind of, kind of like me, he saw there was an interplay going on between people and he just did his police thing. Okay. So he, he's always in that like police mentality. Thank you for sharing that. Do you think, what about Melanie Pulaski? Do you know her well? No, my fiance said, stay clear of her and Zulema. And I was gonna ask about so, Zulema next. So I did, I stayed clear of both of them. I did meet her, I saw her, I didn't get to shake her hand or anything, but I saw her with, you know, uh, Melanie and Lori and she was with that little group, but I did not know her at all. What about um, a vow? Are you a part of a vow, a vow? I was back in like 2015. Um, but I met the people in charge of it, mm -hmm. and that's when um, there was a lot of stuff that happened, and people got into it over certain things, and then another whole forum was made. Okay. Um, from AVAL people that left, and I actually had an AVAL handle, and I went in and talked to certain people. And, raised a few questions and made some statements and it it kind of made waves. And I was like, I, I, I'm not gonna teach here. I'm not gonna, you know, go into anything here in depth. I'm just gonna raise questions and, you know, whatever. And then people started arguing, so I left. Okay. Can I ask you a few of your thoughts on Chad's beliefs, if that's okay? And if you don't know, you don't know. Sure. Um, I don't even know where to begin. Chad created this belief system, you agree, right? And then shared it with others. Would you agree with that? Mm -hmm. Okay. He, he tried to actually recruit people into it. Okay, so he would be the cult leader then. If, if there is a cult, it was the cult of Chad. Is that what you're saying? Pretty much, yeah. Okay. Um, do you think that he fully believed what he was teaching or do you think he knew he was making some of it up? Well, I think he can knew that he had control over individuals. There was a lot of people that would come to the conferences and come to group meetings that were absorbing things like little sponges. And I think he knew that. Mm -hmm. He knew he could influence them. Mm -hmm. um, and there was a lot of them that, believe it or not, they just wanted to hear the higher things, the higher level, you know. They like didn't the come to hear. The special things. Yeah, they wanted to, they wanted to know the, the stuff that wasn't in books. So, right, the stuff that then, wasn't doctrine, the secret stuff, the special stuff. Yeah. And the unfortunately... Pendulum. Most of the people that showed up were not men. They were women of all ages. Mm -hmm. And I noticed that when I would speak, especially at a, at a house or a small group, it, it was mostly women. Did Chad use that to his advantage? I think he did. What would he do? He would pull them aside and talk to them. Tell them they lived in a past life or swing a pendulum or. Yeah, just would, you know, spring stuff on them. And I was like, that stuff doesn't work on me. <laughs> but it might, you know, with them. Flattering the women, would you say? Oh, yeah. He was, he was into grooming and all of that stuff. Into grooming. Yeah. Uh, like I do said, you, think, my, you, you mentioned previously, you kind of thought that maybe Lori chose him, but do you feel like he sort of targeted Lori too? I think once they got to know each other, they kind of clicked like magnets. Um, yeah. They, they both wanted out of where they were and they figured they could start together. Do you think that Lori believed his belief system? 
I don't know if she believed it. I just think personally that she thought she could work it somehow. Work so, his belief system? Yeah. Okay. Do you, why, I mean, we know why they killed the kids in the sense that they declared the children zombies. But do you think that it was Chad's idea or Lori's idea? to kill the kids? I think it was Lori's. You do? I mean, myself. I yeah, that's what you personally think. I think they just wanted the kids out of the way. And so they, they could never... do what? Live their religious dream or? I think they wanted to build something. Kind of like Mike and Nancy had done. Mm -hmm. They built this huge, interstate thing and you know with branches in california and ohio and all over one in florida oklahoma missouri illinois right. you know all over and i think that's kind of what they saw themselves doing they wanted if, to be the next jane or they wanted to be the next mike and nancy jane yeah they wanted to do it bigger better you know all of that did Chad just copy other people's ideas? Was that what he did? Or did he ever, would he just evolve other people's ideas or did he create his own ideas about things? I don't know. I had, I had only really read about a book and a half of his. And it sounded to me like it was, you know, the same thing others were saying in their book. Mm -hmm. So I didn't, I didn't read on. Whose particular books would you say they were similar to? When we first met, Chad gave me a stack of all of his books. He just gave them to me. Mm -hmm. So, and that was with most of the people that I met. If they had a book, they would give it to me. Why, why are you choosing to speak now? because I've been prompted to. Well said. Why did you trust me to tell me your story? Mm. At this point, I was just thinking about who I, you know, who would I actually shout out to, chat to, even say anything to. And I was scrolling last night and I thought, hey, there's two women drinking wine. Maybe I can trust that. I used to love to drink wine. Mine was cranberry love. juice. Mine was cranberry juice, but yes. <laughs> well, I used to like to drink sangria. Mm -hmm. And mine is now, you know, the Mormon sangria. But um, yeah, back in the day, I used to like to drink wine. So I'd be logged on and Right now, because everything has already started, I'm not, not on any witness lists. They have my phone number from, you know, different people. Right. I'm not on there enough. I know our friend Audrey, she called Chad about every single week. That's the reason why she's on the witness list. She called Chad every single day? Every week they talk, they spoke. And that's your friend? Yeah, well, she was actually my my wife's friend from here in Utah. What's her last name? Baratero. Okay, and that's why she's on the witness list. But uh, yeah, she's on there because her number appears on Chad's phone over yeah. and over and over. And I again, the, you... the thing is, he was married. Calling her. I know, do She's you suspect he had multiple married. affairs? So why would he be calling her or she be calling him week after week after week? That's what I'm wondering. Do you think he had uh, multiple affairs beyond Lori? Well, she's never been married. So I think he was just trying to, you know, keep her in the loop, so to speak so that she wouldn't get too far away because okay. she is the sister of the dream girls. 
Okay. So he wanted his, you know, his influence there. So was Chad about, was was Chad, was Chad that, about power and control? Uh, not to begin with. I don't think it was until, you know, after, after 2017. And then it became that something yeah. shifted. Yeah, something changed. And, and do it, you think he thought he was a prophet? I don't know if he saw himself that way. I do know that he saw himself as some kind of religious leader. Mm -hmm. So in any of those, you have to come up with your own system, your own charts, your own evaluations. And I think that's what he and Lori were doing. Mm -hmm. But whenever, you know, anyone would try to give him advice or better him, he just, he wanted to go his own way, his own direction. He'd reject that. Yeah. He came off as a soft-spoken, quiet guy. Was that just a persona? To me, it seemed that way. Um, because he would make jokes about his own family, about, you know, things that happened in the past. Like what? Like at one conference, he was having a hard time um, getting the, his talk going and people were still making noise and talking to each other. And so he went into this um, thing about his grandmother and how his grandmother had spiritually shot him. She took a gun and shot him in the belly. And he woke up and he said, I, okay, he said, I, I figured out right then and there, I'm gonna have to cast grandma out. So he did the Mormon thing and cast grandma's spirit out of the house. And everybody was laughing. And after that, he got their attention. And then he went on with his talk. And it kind of, kind of was funny. I was like, mm. He's telling something about his grandmother, and I, I wouldn't say that in a talk. I don't know if it was true or not, but it was sort of like just casting out an ancestor was a hum it was kind of a joke. Yeah, kind of like an evil spirit, you know. Joke about grandma. Yeah. That's what, what other things would he say? What other weird things like that would he say? Oh, he he had you know different things that he would he would joke about. And he would usually tell her a good joke with every talk. <laughs> Sometimes to get him going, other times just to, you know, to get to wake people up. Did you ever see how he and Tammy treated each other together? Did you ever see them together? Uh, just at church. We had gone to church numerous times while we were in Rexburg and we used to see them all the time, but they were, they would come and talk and, you know, peck each other on the cheek and then go different directions. He had things to do with the priesthood and she was in Relief Society, so. So they'd come in separate cars and leaving separate cars? Well, they always sat together with the kids um, when they could. You mentioned a peck on the cheek. Were they affectionate in other ways? Did they have their arms around each other at church ever? Or yeah, um, one time we we actually stayed so we could speak to both of them, uh, my wife and I. And you know they came out and they put their arms around each other. My wife and I were just talking to them before they had to go back to their house. So, yeah, they just look like a normal couple, to me, anyway. Did uh, Chad warn you of people? Like, I know, for example, in a recorded phone call with Melanie Gibb, he said, don't talk to my sister-in-law, she's dark. Would he ever share with you that people were dark spirits? No. And again, the reason why was he, 
he kind of thought that I had more spiritual oomph than he did. Do you think that he made up his near-death experience or do you think he really felt he had a near-death experience? I think he really felt he had one. Okay. So that would imply that maybe he really did believe himself. Well, I didn't see the evidence of it. Um, like with mine, I can show the, the hospital record. Mm -hmm. You know, when I went, um, I was brought into the emergency room on, um, from a car that pulled up and I couldn't speak. I couldn't, I could just move my eyes. And they recorded all of that, that my heartbeat was, wasn't even a heartbeat. It was like a, a fast jiggle. Right. Yours has right. evidence. And, and, I, and, I, just, and I believe Chad's maybe, but I would have yeah, believed that's it. What I was, yeah. That's what I was waiting for. I was like, where's the evidence? Let's see the evidence. Right. But he went under the water and back up. Yeah. Under and, and back. Yeah. Because, you know, my ex-girlfriend that lives in Oklahoma, she can testify. She did not see it happen. Um, I just, I made it home from where I got struck by lightning. I knew I was in deep water, deep kimchi. Yeah. And I came in and, and I couldn't speak. I couldn't hardly move my limbs. I just, I ended up by the bedside trying to figure out how am I going to wake this woman up? And while I was doing that, I was dripping on her. And that's what woke her up. It was raining outside. Yeah. So she's the one that took me to the emergency room and she went in with me and she saw when I flatlined and I remember I could hear her crying and I didn't know what she was crying about. I was like, yeah. what are you crying about? And they didn't realize, it didn't dawn on me that I had actually died. I was standing there, right, you know, looking at everyone like, what's going on? What, what's she crying about? And I was laying on the stretcher. And I was not in my body. And that was the weirdest feeling. She was crying because I died, I'd flatlined. And they hustled her out. And the nurses that hustled her out, there was more of them than I could see when I was alive. Mm -hmm. So I looked at them and I was, one of them turned back and looked at me and it dawned on me that she wasn't alive. Yeah. She was following a nurse that was alive. And just lickety split, just I I said, I see you. And she said, I see you and you see me. And we're in the spirit. We're not alive. We're talking to Sean. I don't see Sean. I know this is him right here. He just wants to talk without video, and we're on video. So um, Sean, before we Go. I'd like to talk to you again. Um, I probably have to get back to my family, but I'm not done listening to you. Get back to um, my family. Oh, yeah. But um. No, no, no. Okay. But um. You saw Kay on the chat. Kay Woodcock on the chat yesterday. Is that correct? Yeah. Is there anything you want to say to the victims of Chad and Lori? Well, kind of like what I was saying to Kay and Larry is, you know, I'm sorry this happened to you. And I'm actually sorry I didn't get back with them. They had reached out before. And I, I like I said, I had had um, health issues. And there was a bunch of things that I didn't answer to at that time. And basically, it's because I was incapacitated in the hospital. So I, you know, I'm sorry I didn't get back with them. I know they had a bunch of names that were close to everyone. Mm -hmm. I didn't, I actually did not know the kids. I did not know Lori even had kids. I didn't know her that well. I just knew who she was. So I'm sorry that happened to them. And you knew Chad more than Lori. Yeah. I knew Melanie. I knew 
I had seen some of the others down there and I knew all the people within the circle, you know. Do you think Melanie, do you think Melanie Gibb knew that Charles was going to be murdered like beforehand? I think she knew a lot of things. I just didn't think she believed it could happen. So she was hearing a lot of the interplay, but you weren't, you don't know if she really thought it was going to come, like, have yeah. to go through fruition, come to fruition. Yeah. Like when she said she had, you know, her friend had the right to kill someone. Uh, I don't think she actually really knew that that was going to happen. Right. When did she say that her friend had the right to kill someone? Oh, that was when she was interviewing. You know, we we actually, my wife and I tuned into it and listened to it. The Nate Eaton interview? Yeah, the, the interviews. The Lord's not going to allow a generation of unbalanced people to go into the millennium. So we were like, uh, we're seeing it. You know, they're all coming out to the conferences with some of them have really crazy ideas. And I'm like, it's only a matter of time before something happens. And sure enough, you know, happened with the Daybells and Lori. And there's been other things that have happened, just there hasn't been murders. Yeah. You know, and I'm like, it was building up to this for years. This is not a single thing. It was like, this is just the top of the pyramid. There's a whole right. pyramid underneath it. And I think that's the reason why this, this whole system needs to be wiped. Mm -hmm. And we're starting to see the beginnings of that. I agree with what you're saying. So what it's that? not just, you know, what's going to happen to Chad and Lori. In my heart, I know they'll never be free for the rest of their lives.